Uh, we're glad to have you all back. I wish we ordered some better weather for today, but I invite you to come back when it's a little sunnier and we can have a conversation while we enjoy the vista overlooking the River Valley. Second, Middlesex Community College is in the forefront of criminal justice reform. We have a strong partnership with Wesleyan University and the Connecticut Department of Correction, known as the Center for Prison Education. CPE offers college coursework to students incarcerated at Cheshire and York Correctional Institutions. Our program is one of only 67 in the United States chosen to participate in the Second Chance Pell Pilot. This has allowed us to use federal financial aid dollars in addition to private funds raised by Wesleyan to support higher education in the prisons. I need not recap all the benefits of prison education programs today, but I can tell you that several students have continued their college education upon release into the community and they've become positive, productive members of our community. One of the most transformative moments of my career came last August when I awarded 24 associate degrees inside the walls of Cheshire and York to prisoner students. I'd like... I'd like to thank Dr. Clifton Watson, Director of Wesleyan University's Jewett Center for Community Partnerships, for overseeing this program together with Middlesex and the DOC. Thank you, Clifton. And third, Middlesex Community College has a strong associate degree program in criminal justice and criminology studies. Under the leadership of Professor Rebecca Rist Brown, herself a former police officer, our faculty include chiefs of police, state prosecutors, correction officials, and attorneys. We offer a rigorous and relevant curriculum to students who aspire to careers in law enforcement, corrections, or the legal profession. We offer unique Saturday seminars on topics such as video forensics, canine, and cannabis, and an accelerated online option to allow students to complete their degree in 13 months. Each year, between 175 and 200 students enroll in these programs out of a total student population of about 2,700. And just this past May, we awarded 60 associate degrees in these programs, double the number from the previous year. And our graduates represent a mix of students newly entering criminal justice careers, transferring to a public or private university to obtain their bachelor's degree. Our alumni also include career professionals seeking a college degree for promotion and to make themselves more marketable in their fields. One example is Captain Gary Wallace, class of 2009, who is the Investigative Services Division Commander of the Middletown Police Department. Gary worked with the college through a portfolio review process to obtain college credits for courses he took during the military service and in his initial training as a police officer. And we want to thank you, Gary, for your service to our community and to our country. Thank you, Gary. <laughs> this public act presents opportunities for colleges like Middlesex to revise and strengthen our curriculum in cr criminal justice. We see this as an opportunity to provide continuing education to those currently in the field, and we stand ready to work with all of you in the room to design that curriculum that will support implementation. This bill also offers opportunities for enhanced research within the criminal justice system and among universities and organizations like the Urban Institute to make sure that we act in a fair and transparent manner throughout our criminal justice system. Thank you for the opportunity to speak for a few moments. Welcome to Middlesex Community College, and it's now my pleasure to introduce Mark Pelka, the Undersecretary of Criminal Justice for the state's Office of Policy and Management. Thank you very much, sir, Go uh, Governor Lamont, Lieutenant Governor Beisewitz, Dr. Minkler. It's a real honor to be in front of you all today. I'm, behind me are really people who worked incredibly hard and provided their leadership to get this bill past the finish line with unanimous votes. Uh, Senator Winfield, Representative Porter, and I think it's also worth noting this is something of a love fest because we have stakeholders from across the criminal justice system in the room today. We have prosecutors, public defender's office, we have victim advocates for victims of sexual violence, survivors of sexual violence, coalition against domestic violence. We have justice impacted people who are working the smart justice campaign to advocate on behalf of themselves, their family members, their communities, their neighborhoods that have been impacted by the justice system. And it's exciting to think that the U.S. is watching us. Today's press conference is being followed by states across the country that are looking to increase data and transparency in our criminal justice system. And it means a lot that this is the first criminal justice bill that Governor Lamont put forward in his first year in office. And 
Recognizing the governor's business background, I'll provide a quote from a man described as the founder of modern management. Peter Drucker said, if you can't measure it, you can't improve it. Prosecutors, <laughs> and I say improving it, prosecutors play a crucial role in the criminal justice system. They're rightly described as the gatekeepers of the criminal justice system. They um, handle cases from the beginning until the end in powerful ways, yet few data are available on prosecutorial decision making. Nationally, police departments, corrections agencies, supervision agencies are able to track data on their operations and provide trends to state policymakers like Representative Porter and Senator Winfield to inform policy and, and budget decisions. Uh, this, this trend has not been prevalent among prosecutors' offices nation, nationwide yet, which means that prosecutors may be missing information that could help them to better identify and respond to trends, to set safety and justice goals, and measure their success. Key questions that confront Connecticut include, how can Connecticut better deploy its resources to reduce crime? How can it address factors contributing to racial and ethnic disparities in our criminal justice system? How do pretrial decisions impact the outcomes of cases? How can victims be more meaningfully involved in court processes? And what is the effect of plea negotiations on the outcomes of cases? Communities around our state and around our country are increasingly looking for data to understand the decision making and outcomes of the criminal justice system. Connecticut has three reforms that are, uh, have been carried out in just the first year of this movement. First, this legislation will require the routine collection, analysis, and reporting of prosecutorial decision-making data. Second, the legislation makes reforms to the Criminal Justice Commission, which is the body that, uh, that uh, appoints and reappoints prosecutors in key positions around our state. And third, thanks to this, and thanks to this legislation, CJC meetings will be more open and transparent. Notifications will be posted. Meetings will be held in the legislative office building, and the public will be able to provide input. Third, Governor Lamont appointed a slate of members to the Criminal Justice Commission. The Supreme, a sitting Supreme Court justice, a sitting judge, a former prosecutor, a practicing attorney, and a poet, memorist, and lawyer who also has served time in prison. I'm referring to Duane Betts, a justice-impacted person who is bringing his perspective to the review of prosecutors. Governor Lamont made history when he appointed Duane Betts as a formerly incarcerated person, the first to serve on the CJC. The ACL... Recognizing the heart that the ACLU Smart Justice Campaign brought to this issue, Dwayne Betts is going to bring his personal experiences to discussions around the appointment of prosecutors at our state. That's compelling information. And I want to recognize the Smart Justice Campaign members, the Sea of Blue, who are all gathered here today. It's very exciting to have you here. Senate Bill 880 creates a framework, timeline, and process for collecting, analyzing, and presenting information on prosecutorial decision making. I want to thank Robin Olson and her team from the Urban Institute, which released a national survey and report on the use of data in prosecutors' offices around the country. Urban Institute's isolation of foundational data elements helped us focus on the priority data. And Connecticut is now recognized as the first state in the country to require the collection, analysis, and reporting of case-level prosecutor data. Implementation is where it really matters. That's where the rubber hits the road. And I want to recognize the staff from the Office of Policy and Management's Criminal Justice and uh, Policy and Planning Division. The research staff from Ivan Kuzik, Kyle Bowden, and Kendall Babula will be leading this effort. And we're also joined from the Criminal Justice Information System, Mark Tazaris, who will be linking together complex data systems to make this possible. This is as much a criminal justice reform movement as it is uh, uh, le leveraging data and technology in our state to make this possible. And it's great that we're here in Middletown, because Middlesex uh, Judicial District is the first court in the country, or in, our, in our state, where prosecutors will roll out their electronic case management system. In closing, I'd like to share um, that uh, by introducing this bill at the start of his term, Governor Lamont convened a wide array of stakeholders. We're still in this together. We started together. We're in it together. We're going to work on this during implementation together. He brought that st stakeholders around the goal of better measuring and tracking justice system outcomes to help victims people in the system and taxpayers alike. Now, although I've talked a lot about data so far, the secret sauce to legislation, why it passed unanimously in the House and Senate, thanks to Representative Porter and Senator Winfield and others, the secret sauce is consensus building and trust. This isn't gotcha, this isn't sneaking up and releasing trends that, you know, in data at the 11th hour. This is working co co collaboratively, comprehensively as stakeholders and justice impacted people to review this information and present it in ways that can improve our overall system. 
And that trust is enabling us all to come together today and Governor Lamont, by signing the bill into law, surrounded by prosecutors, victim advocates, justice reform advocates, and others, he's making Connecticut, again, a national leader in requiring the routine collection, analysis, and reporting of prosecutorial decision-making data. So thank you, everybody, for the thrilling day. I have the privilege of introducing Gus Marks Hamilton. He's a licensed master social worker and certified recovery support specialist. Um, that's responsive, and, and, and he was a field organizer on the Smart Justice Campaign, working last summer all the way through today and into the future on efforts to uh, promote criminal justice reform. So, Gus, we're grateful you're here. Eager to hear from you, sir. Good morning, everyone, and thank you to Dr. Minkler. Um, Governor Lamont, uh, Lieutenant Governor Bicewitz, uh, Under Secretary Pelica, um, Senator Winfield, uh, Representative Porter, um, and everyone who has come uh, to Middlesex Community College to witness this important moment for Connecticut's criminal justice system. My name is Gus Marks Hamilton, and I'm a field organizer with the ACLU's Smart Justice Campaign here in Connecticut. And four years ago, I was actually a student uh, on this campus. Um, I was taking a couple of classes, warming up for a master's program I was about to begin at the University of Connecticut. So. I'm truly honored to be back uh, on this beautiful campus again um, to talk about Public Act 1959, an act increasing fairness and transparency in the criminal justice system. The Smart Justice Campaign envisions a world in which communities are safe and strong, where our government is investing in people rather than prisons and jails. Our campaign is led by people who have been directly impacted by the criminal justice system and believe that we can do better. This new transparency law reflects the power of policymakers listening to formerly incarcerated people. Last summer, the Smart Justice Campaign asked every candidate for governor, including Governor Lamont, to pledge to introduce legislation to create transparency about prosecutors' decisions. Governor Lamont fulfilled that promise by introducing the law that we are here to celebrate today. When the General Assembly unanimously passed this bill, it also reflected the conversations we had had with legislatures, legislators throughout the session, them listening to the Smart Justice Campaign and its leaders. Today's law is a step forward for transparency. Prosecutors hold a tremendous amount of power, yet without this law, Connecticut residents have had very little information about the cases prosecutors take, case outcomes, and the people they prosecute. Prosecutors' decisions directly affect the lives of tens of, thousands of people of, tens of thousands of people in Connecticut every day. And with that power comes a responsibility to be open with the public so that, they, so that all of us can make a better system and better serve the interests of justice. Everyone has a role in ending mass incarceration in Connecticut. This act had the support of Connecticut voters, reform advocates, victims' rights advocates, and the chief state's attorney, Kevin Kane. But its passage is just the beginning. People across the country will be watching Connecticut to see how we implement this groundbreaking opportunity. Transparency about prosecutors' decisions and public hearings on prosecutors' appointments by the Criminal Justice Commission are just the first steps toward creating a justice system that creates true public safety by ending mass incarceration. I thank everyone here for their efforts to get us to this point and the work that we still have to do. So thank you. <laughs> thank you, Gus. There was a uh, congressional uh, hearing held, uh, there was a Capitol Hill meeting held about a month or so ago, and our Deputy Chief State's Attorney, Kevin Lawler, traveled down to brief a uh, group of people about this bill, and uh, Gus Marks Hamilton and many members of Smart Justice Campaign came down too and received a lot of applause by their counterparts and people around the country for their efforts. We would not be here today were it not for our Chief State's Attorney, Kevin Kane. Uh, Kevin Kane, um, it's, it's, in, it's uh, auspicious that we're meeting here in Middletown today because that's where he began his lifelong career as a prosecutor. He served as Assistant Prosecuting Attorney here uh, for this uh, Middlesex County before moving on to uh, uh, Prosecuting Attorney and then embarking on, a, on service and as the Administrative Head of the Division of Criminal Justice where he served as our Chief State's Attorney. Chief State's Attorney Kevin Kane reviewed proposals and draft legislation, and he carefully reviewed the impact this would have on state's attorney's offices around our state, and he reached the determination that this legislation would help 
prosecutors receive more real-time feedback on decisions they make every day. It would enable for a more efficient and effective uh, operation and management of prosecutors' offices, and it would help prosecutors tell their story. Based on that, on that decision, Chief State's Attorney Kane said he would take a leap of faith, uh, a first big leap of faith together on this legislation to support greater transparency and data. And I'm grateful to introduce Chief, Chief State's Attorney Kevin Kane and ask him to deliver a few remarks about the bill today. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much, Mark. And Mark, you're a welcome addition to this state. You've been terrific. You've been really helpful uh, in dealing with criminal justice issues and recognizing the role of prosecutor in this state. Uh, I'm, it's hard for me to believe, but it was 47 years ago this week that I became a, an assistant prosecutor in, in Middletown. Uh, our role is the same. Our function as prosecutors is the same. Connecticut is very, very unique, and it's unique in a wonderful way which I think we, should, we need to understand. Uh, we as prosecutors have been for 200 and some odd years, 250 years, we were appointed by the judges. The reason was that for that was to separate prosecutors from politics and to separate prosecutors uh, from the, the motions and, and, and what uh, a long-serving Chief Justice of the Connecticut Supreme Court called the vagaries of public opinion. Uh, it was thought that by having us be more independent, we could be separated from that. We've seen the emotions and how emotions play into criminal justice policy, swinging the pendulum from one extreme to the other. And I think we're blessed in Connecticut because we have that function. Uh, our function is the same. We're the prosecutors who represent the public in the criminal justice system. We're the attorneys for the public, and the public is our client. Uh, for a long time now, I, I, in 2007, the state's attorneys, and the chief state's attorney is only part of the Division of Criminal Justice. The Division of Criminal Justice is composed of the 13 state's attorneys and the chief state's attorney. Together we form the criminal justice, the Division of Criminal Justice. In 2007, after the, the uh, horrendous crime that occurred in Cheshire, uh, 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 there was a strong desire to have mandatory minimum sentences increased, three strikes and you're, out, and you're out laws passed, improvement in the functioning of the death penalty, and we, the state's attorneys, got together and said we don't really need those things. What we need is an, elect, is, is an, in, is an information technology system which allows us to receive and store information and get it to the decision makers so that they can make informed decisions all the way throughout the process, from a police officer responding to the scene to a prosecutor deciding whether or not to charge somebody with a crime, and if so, what charge, and if so, on behalf of the public, what, what sentence to seek, to a judge, a sentencing judge, to a defense attorney who needs the information to defend the case, then to the, the Department of Adult Probation to, to do pre-sentence investigation, and then to have later on for the Department of Corrections to be able to decide how to safely monitor and, and help people who, who were sentenced to the Commissioner of Corrections, and then to the parole board so the parole board could make informed decisions in deciding whether or not to grant or deny parole and under what conditions. That was 2007. Twelve years later, we still don't have that yet. We're almost there. I've been doing this 47 years, my legs are starting to give out, my dreams are still as real as they were uh, in 47 years ago. I'm still as excited today as I was in 1972 when I became a prosecutor. And all of a sudden, what happened? The smart justice people came along and said, we want to scrutinize you prosecutors. You have more power. You're the black box. We want to hold you accountable. We need more data to be able to hold you accountable and transparency. I always thought we were transparent because we do our business in open court. When I was a prosecutor here in 72, the Middletown Press would come out at the end of the day, the end of the day, and every case we had was listed in the, pa in the, in the paper. The sentences, the nollies, the reasons for the nollies sometimes, and the public had that and said, what are you doing nollying so many cases? You're nollying 40% of the cases that come in, why is that? Uh, then we set up this phenomenal system of diversionary programs that are wonderful, and, and the legislature enacted them one by one, and kind of things got lost. All of a sudden, you didn't see that. At the end of the process, cases were dismissed or nollied, and people didn't really understand why. 
The smart justice people wanted us to be transparent, wanted to accumulate data to hold us accountable. Well, that's fine, that's great. We said, come on, it wasn't just a leap of faith. We're the lawyers who represent the public. The public should know what we're doing. We're making the decisions, the decisions we make, we make on behalf of the public, trying to bring about what we believe justice in each and every individual case. And lo and behold, they came on board and all of a sudden we have 880, we have Governor Lamont who wants to start, I don't understand the technology these days you do in the business, e-government, electronic government, digital information. Everything we have is on paper that comes in. We have to wait for the police to bring him to the, uh, the courthouse. We get a case, we get the clerk's office processes the files, makes our files, we get a file in five minutes we have to decide whether or not to charge somebody with a crime. If so, what bond to recommend? Because the case is going to be called in court, because the court has to call a case to move the 150 people out of the courthouse that day. That's the system. Now we're about to get this electronically. I didn't think we were going to get it. I don't think my legs will hold out much longer uh, to the finish line. And I really had not had much hope and was very sad about it because I wanted to bring that about more than anything before I go. Governor Lamont got elected, talked about e-data. The smart justice people came along in a manner that many of us perceived as to be threatening and wanting to hold us accountable. But we should be accountable. And lo and behold, all of a sudden we got something. And we got the resources to bring that across the finish line. And now we're starting to focus on our charging decision that we make before a case comes into court, before we go through a process of having to continue a case 10 times and have a defendant have to keep coming back to court 10 times. Many of them can't get their act together and don't know what day it is and end up getting rearrested or getting a new charge. We can get information ahead of time and decide what's the best thing for the public to handle with this case. How do we relieve the, we relieve the community of the consequences of low-level criminal behavior that drives businesses out of, out of, out of neighborhoods, that causes uh, people not to want to use the parks and the playgrounds and hesitate about having their kids walk or play outside? How do we relieve the community of that nonviolent crime without getting it caught up in the expense of the criminal justice system. If prosecutors can do as what we used to do in, in, in the late uh, 1960s and early 70s and decide up front what's the best thing to do with this case and have some informed information. And it's all coming together now. And thanks. Now we have work to do, though. And it's wonderful. Mark Pelk has brought people from the Urban Institute here together to sit down and say, OK, data. Data sounds great. We now have to decide, okay, what kind of data do we need to collect? How can we do it meaningfully to measure uh, what we do for policymakers to make decisions, for prosecutors to make the decisions we need to make to decide uh, what to do, for police to be able to respond safely? How do we get data to do that and get it together? What data is meaningful and how do we put it into context so that the data doesn't lead to misleading conclusions? That's the work we have to do and we have to roll up our sleeves and, and get together and do that. I've got a little bit of le left in my legs and I want to get started and, 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 and get that underway, but I really think it's underway and I want to thank you all, every one of you. Thank the people who initially we perceived to be not friendly, but they are. The smart justice people are here. <laughs> and, and that's the way we do things, by working together. And we have to do that and we will do that. And thank you very much, Governor Lamont. You brought a spirit of cooperation and goodwill to this state in, in an optimistic manner and uh, uh, I'm glad you're here. I'm very glad you're here and I'm very glad you're all here and paying attention to this. Thank you. Thank you very much for Chief State's attorney and I know his legs may be tiring a bit but he's got a whole lineup of people behind him ready to help out and push this over the finish line. We are in Middletown again, which is where the first state's attorney will be rolling out an electronic case management system. State's attorney Galen will be in the fall uh, working with in concert with CGIS and other partners to begin using electronic case management system to get that data together. And I've had the pleasure of, of, of knowing and respecting the leadership of Senator Winfield over many years from his election to the State House in 2008 and to the Senate in 2014. He's a man of character, integrity, moral backbone, commitment to helping people in communities around our state. 
He brings a bipartisan approach that, that brought on board the ranking members of the Judiciary Committee, Representative Rabimbus and Senator Kissel, who wanted to be here today, but had a commitment out of state. Senator Winfield has led on the abolition of the death penalty, reforming our racial profiling laws, and this session passing a police accountability reform. So when Senator Winfield takes up an issue and carries it, no, nothing can get in his way. He is a force of nature, but he's also a force of nature that brings people together. And it was indispensable to be able to support his leadership this session on this legislation. So without further ado, the chair of our Joint Judiciary Committee, Senator Winfield. Good morning. So, uh, I'm listening to Kevin and I'm thinking, I hadn't seen the agenda, I was like, I know I gotta follow Kevin, right? <laughs> like, um, I, I wanna thank uh, Middlesex Community College for having us. I wanna thank the governor for putting this on his agenda. Um, that helped a lot. Uh, I wanna thank my co-chair, Steve Stashum, and the ranking members of the Judiciary <laughs> Committee. I wanna thank all of the people in the legislature, like my partner here, Representative Porter, who find these issues to be important enough to year after year come back and fight for them. Um, Kevin Kaye talked about 2007. 2007, it was a year before I ran for office, um, and the state was, in my opinion, moving in the wrong direction, um, and I was an activist at the time, and I saw somebody when I walked in the room today, and it reminded me about that era in time, because we came to fight the three strikes proposal and pulling people back into uh, the state who had been out of the state, and people who had been out doing good jobs and got pulled back in because of the fear uh, that we had, and that was Louise Harvey, who's standing in the back here. Um, and she's, a, she's an activist who's been an activist for a long time. On these issues, we tend to be around for a long time. So it's good to be here today uh, for this bill signing. You know, Kevin also uh, mentioned the vagaries of public opinion. Part of the reason that this bill is so important is because when you don't have transparent data, what you have is fear that makes people function in a certain way. I am very happy that this is a bill where we're all standing here together on a lot of the criminal justice bills. That's not, that's not the story even when we signed the bill. The story is a little bit different. But I have to thank the state's attorneys uh, for coming and understanding that what we were doing was not coming after them. What we were doing was making their job better, easier, simpler, better to understand. We're not just looking forward with this data, but we get to look back and find out if we're actually on the right track. Something we can't do without that data. It is critical to the state of Connecticut. It's not just tens of thousands of people like you heard a little bit a while ago. It's over three million people this bill is critical to. Because in one way or another, what we do with that transparent data at this point will affect every single one of us. It will affect the taxes you pay. It will affect whether the people who are around you are able to get jobs or if they're required to because we have put barriers in place, required to do things that they don't want to do, that's going to affect you. And so to me, this was the most important bill that we did this year. This bill, like a lot of other bills, but in a very direct way, even though we don't think about it, affects every single person who walks around in this state. Um, and so I wanna thank the governor again for putting it on his agenda. And I wanna thank the people in the blue shirts because um, part of the bill that's most important to me is the part that we talked about with uh, Dwayne Betts. And a lot of people have been walking around talking about the people uh, who've had experience with certain problems. There's a saying that a uh, representative Porter likes to say to people who are closest to the problem or closest, should be closest to the solution. I think that saying uh, is correct. I also think it's true that the people who are closest to the problem should be closest to the power to do something about it. And so, And so uh, if there were no other part of this bill, that in and of itself is worth all of the work that we did. Thank you all again. Thank you, Senator Winfield. And I know that a, mem a colleague in this, of yours in the state Senate, Senator Lesser is all right. Thank you so much, sir, for being with us, another tireless leader of criminal justice reform. And I have the privilege of introducing Governor Lamont next. And I think that he sent a signal during uh, last summer when the Smart Justice Pledge was presented to him. He signed on to it and he pledged his uh, steadfast devotion to getting these policy reforms through. From my very first day on the job, that's is all that I focused on, was fulfilling the governor's vision and supporting the direction that he was trying to send our state in. Uh, I think it says a lot that this is a bill that the governor introduced for his first on criminal justice reforms, certainly not his last. 
It appeals to him because of the role of data and technology, the use of data to better inform criminal justice system outcomes, the governor's desire to bring people together. By introducing this bill, he did that, from the courts to prosecutors to victim advocates to justice impacted people and more. And he's sending us forward on a direction through the implementation of this bill to support a more efficient, a more fair, and a more just criminal justice system. So without further ado, uh, Governor Lamont, we're eager to hear from you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. And um, yeah, Gary Winfield is a force of nature, and he's also a very persistent force of nature. Uh, I had some learning to do on this issue, and one of the first people I met with was Gary back in a restaurant in New Haven well over a year ago, and he said, this is really important for our community. And um, Robin's been right there with him, and Matt Lesser, uncharacteristically in the back row, um, <laughs> reminding me what this means. Uh, you know, Mark is too modest. Um, you know, at OPM, we, we're talking budgets and numbers and data, and uh, at every one of these meetings, Mark is there reminding us what criminal justice reform means for this uh, state. Uh, and from a point of view of a policy person and a numbers person, uh, what that is. And uh, talk about persistent. The smart justice folks, you guys are everywhere. Everywhere I went for uh, well over a year and a half. Um, and uh, you should be there. And, and, and this is, you know, this is what I learned. I mean, um, Ke Kevin says it so well. We're here representing the public. So, okay, I'm the e-government guy and data and transparency, but this bill is a lot more than that. It's really about trust, and it's about giving people confidence. In this tough day and age we live in where we don't trust each other, we don't trust government, and, we, uh, and the lines are getting uh, blurred in terms of uh, how we work together. And uh, there's, there's no conflict in criminal justice and criminal justice reform and transparency. Yeah, we're holding people accountable, but I also think we're showing people we're doing good work a lot of the time. And I gotta convince people, the people up here are trying their very best to do what we can. And that that's what this is about, to me, is also building trust between the law enforcement community and our community leaders and giving folks another chance, giving them that trust as well. You know, I learned so much when I went to that true program in Cheshire and I saw some young people. They weren't criminals. They were folks who had made a terrible mistake uh, some years ago and um, they were ready to get back on their feet. And uh, that's what I learned when I went there. And that's what I love about what was going on here in the Middlesex Community College and the programs you're providing to give people that second chance. Uh, but most importantly, I just want to get back to trust and community. I mean, uh, if we don't do anything else up here, and Kevin said it so well, how many years, 47 years? <laughs> You're still standing, you're still running, let's go, I'm right next to you. <laughs> but um, we've got to give people the confidence that what we're doing going forward is we're looking out for them. And that's what this bill does. It is just shedding a light on some things that have been too often misunderstood and, uh, and we we're very suspicious of it, and I was very suspicious of it. And I think what we're going to show through this is that um, we, we have nothing to be ashamed of. We can learn from our mistakes. We're not afraid to be held accountable. And that's why I'm so proud to sign this bill today. And thanks for being here with each and every one of you. I learned a lot from all of you. Thanks.